Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Eagles Unfiltered. I'm your co-host Ed Kratz, joined by my colleague John McMullen. We are with SI.com's Eagle Maven, and I hope you're following all our training camp work at SI.com slash NFL slash Eagles or at EaglesMaven.com. It's actually EagleMaven.com. Anyway, uh, day two, training camps is in the books. It's starting to get a little uh, overcast here in Philadelphia. Some rain moving in, but the Eagles did get that second practice in today. And we got a glimpse right out of the gate in the first seven-on-seven seven, uh, of the future. Jalen Hurts hits Devontae Smith for an 80-yard touchdown pass. John, take us take us through the – Well, I don't know I don't know if it's the future from Jalen's standpoint, but it is from Devontae Smith because he's going to be here. He's going to be yeah. a big part of this team. And it did excite the crowd. It certainly was the biggest roar – of the afternoon so or the morning so to speak when he got behind steven nelson on a go route and, and went for the touchdown and it's exciting to see let's be honest this team has not had wide receivers that could make plays down the field so you see that you you get some optimism that was exciting jalen rager back on the field after missing day one greg ward was back on the field as well jalen rager was he on the field he was on the field doing individual okay. work uh, but, uh, again, getting a little bit healthier, still not in team drills, as you mentioned. Right. Um, and, you know, this has kind of shifted things. You have Michael Walker out there getting reps. J.J. Ortega Whiteside. John Hightower made a big, um, made a big play yeah. later in practice. So yeah. these guys are getting some opportunities maybe they wouldn't have gotten because of these injuries. Obviously, Devontae Smith, though, and Jalen Rager. Those are the two guys the Eagles have to count on. And who was the cornerback, John, on that play that Devontae Smith blew by? It was Stephen Nelson. Stephen Nelson. Yeah, well, the you know, guy. St Stephen Nelson, who talked after practice, remember, he signed on July 25th. Monday. Tra yeah, training camp started on Wednesday. Right. He was at the first team corner for the first rep. That tells you where the Eagles were at corner. They need him in there, but obviously hasn't been doing off-season work, so it's not a surprise that... Yeah that he got beat early in practice, but I don't think it's something to be concerned about. No, absolutely not. But it was exciting. It drew a lot of oohs and ahs from the crowd for sure when it happened. But it, when it happened, I, I was kind of watching it out of my peripheral vision as you and I split up on the field. You were watching more of that seven-on-seven. Seven. I, I spent some time watching one-on-ones, and you were probably watching that as well with your peripheral vision on the other field. Uh, and a uh, very noticeable thing happened during one-on-ones, and uh, that was Andre Dillard, who uh, really um, did not have a good day. Let's put it that way. He got beaten twice by Derek Barnett pretty badly, uh, I must say, uh, not even really putting up much of a fight. Uh, and then even throughout the one uh he didn't do any running with the ones, I don't believe. I think Jordan no, Malata got Jordan, all the first team yeah. reps today. So it was sort of back and forth, Andre Dillard. And that's what they said they were going to do. They were going to have back and forth days in the spring, Every time we were allowed in, which wasn't much, it was three days, Jordan Mylotta took the first team reps. Yep. But Jordan himself kind of confirmed that, no, it's not that. We're switching days. It just happened to be luck of the draw. And that's where we are early in camp. But, you know, it's interesting. Andre Dillard one day one, Jordan Mylotta one day two. And we're about competition. We're going to talk about that because Lane Johnson gave us an interesting tidbit. Nick Sirianni's so competitive. What does he do, Ed? He creates practice, and he awards a winner. Now, anybody who was here yesterday knows the defense won. Yeah. Lane thinks the offense won today, but he'll know later today. I do think it's interesting. He's even declaring a winner for each practice session. Yeah, and Lane said, everything we do is about competition. So, yeah, there's a winner and loser each week or each day, offense or defense. So now that becomes a question we have to ask every day is who won – yesterday's practice so after he went through yeah. everything that was charted uh, because Lane said defense without question won yesterday he thinks today the offense won um, it certainly looked better I thought Jalen Hurts looked better today as well you mentioned that play to Hightower that was a nice throw from Hurts uh, he had another nice throw. I can't remember the receiver on the play before that um, but he looked a little bit better uh, with his comfort level uh, throwing the ball and you know that's probably because they were running some plays that he had some familiarity with uh, but better today, I thought, than yesterday. Well, and remember, they were in close quarters, yes. as I called it yesterday, only right. doing red zone work, and that was more of a training staff recommendation. 
Uh, they didn't want guys running 80 yards down the field like Devontae Smith. I don't know what 24 hours does for you, but evidently that was the ramp up period. Devontae Smith with a bigger field and seven on sevens was able to do things maybe he wasn't able to do in those in those close circumstances, in a phone booth as they call it. Mm -hmm. Where I thought, you know, the player of the day for me yesterday was Darius Slay because of what he was able to do with Devontae Smith. But again, that's in a very short area. Once you open up the whole field, it becomes more difficult for the defense. So interesting. Yesterday, Smith or uh, Slay was your player of the day. Who who would you put as your player of the day for uh, today, uh, Thursday? I'm still mulling it over. <laughs> I, I I'm thinking about Derek Barnett because he was so dominant in those one-on-one -on -one drills. Yes, he was. I'm thinking about Devonte Smith because of the big play. Um, I didn't see a lot of real standouts. You know who's been really, really solid to me for the first two days? Michael Walker, yes. who nobody knows. Yep. He played really well day one, really well day two. So I might go Michael Walker. I'm still mulling that Yeah, over. you know, it's funny when you say that because I'm thinking the same thing. Like, Michael Walker has really uh, kind of done everything that you, you would expect him to do. Uh, he's catching the ball. They had him working, uh, I think, well, they didn't have him in the punt return game yesterday. I don't think they really worked on the punt game, which is interesting. They didn't do a lot of special teams work no, they today. Uh, yesterday, a little bit more of an emphasis. Today, I think they only had one session of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of a departure from Doug Peterson, who seemed to run special teams drills every 20 minutes. Um, not so much with Nick Sirianni. Uh, let, let's get into uh, the offensive line a little bit. Um, today was a little bit of a scary moment. Um, uh, Brandon Brooks. Brandon Brooks, yeah. He uh, ends up getting – I saw him walking off the field with a trainer, went right into the tent, and then a few minutes later he went into the locker room. Uh, but it was announced by the Eagles that it was a precautionary measure, that it was a hamstring issue. But now, you know, you look at that and you couple that with Isaac Ciamalu being week to week with a hamstring issue. And, John, all of a sudden this offensive line looks like, you know, the last year when it was decimated. Yeah, and we, we're – I mean, Howie Roseman talked to us yesterday – and he brought it up by himself. He wasn't even prompted. He started talking about how good this offensive line was. You can tell they think this is the strength of their team. And I agree with them from the perspective of, okay, if these guys are healthy, they're all talented, they're all ready to go, but already we're seeing attrition. Yeah. Now it doesn't matter. We haven't even hit August yet. Uh, Isaac Sayamala should be back in a couple weeks. Um, Eagles claim uh, Brandon Brooks today was just a precaution. That's all it was. Nothing more, nothing serious. But with his injury history, yeah, it was a scary moment. And let's let's face it, at that position, that group, more than any other, is dependent on continuity. So if you're not practicing together, it's tough to get that continuity. And maybe it, it puts them back at least a few weeks. Well, here's the good news on that is Nate Herbig looks really good. You know, I was watching him in individual drill surfacing blocks with Statlin and Jason Kelsey. And, you know, he had a very good year last year. But I think he, you know, he had a, he did a lot this offseason. He talked about it. He worked out with Lane Johnson at his barn. And uh, to me, he looks like a completely different player physically. Uh, I think he's lost weight. Lane Johnson mentioned that he lost about, about 35 pounds. Right, about 35 pounds. So uh, he's working at the left guard spot where Siamalo would be. Today when Brooks went out, Matt Pryor got in. And, that was um, not good. It, well, it wasn't good, but maybe the offense won the day. I mean, we, we don't know. Maybe yeah. the offense did win with Matt Pryor playing right guard. But uh, I guess in the, the more good news is it is still July. Uh, and if they're going to have injuries, now's the time. But, you know, the pads haven't even come on yet. And you've got guys suffering some soft tissue stuff. So that, that's a bit of a concern uh, in my book. It's been a concern for yeah. the Eagles for years, and that's one of the reasons they had this ramp up here, and that's what Nick Sirianni said yesterday. That's what the training staff recommended. Don't have guys sort of bearing. Now, you don't think about that anyway for offensive linemen. So it, it's been persistent. I, I mean, people have questioned it. Reporters have questioned this team. What are you doing differently than other teams who don't have those soft seeming, at least seemingly don't have the same level as soft tissue injury problems as the Eagles. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it it it's it seems pretty consistent. Yeah. So you have to start looking at 
Now they've changed medical staffs, they've changed training staff, they've done a lot of different things. Yeah. Maybe it, you do just chalk it up to bad luck. Yeah, I guess. Before we move away from the offensive line, I just want to point out uh, another player that's kind of opened up a little bit of my eyes, maybe yours, uh, Luke Jariga. Uh, has gotten all the second team reps at center. I know, you know, look, Landon Dickerson is still not cleared to participate in practice. He's out there watching. Um, but to me, Luke Chiriga, and he had a very good one-on-one -on -one session, in my opinion. He stood up a couple pass rushers, uh, stopped them dead in their tracks. Um, and I know Jason Kelsey really likes Luke Chiriga as well. He's even he's told me that. Um, so, you know, Luke Chiriga could be a guy – Everybody thinks Landon Nickerson is going to be the backup center, and the Eagles might think that. But Luke Chiriga certainly looks like a capable second-string center behind Jason Kelsey. Yeah, and one thing Jeff Stoutman does every year is he has a developmental center. He always says he wants one. He always says he needs one. He wants one to try and develop. Obviously, that was Luke Chiriga last year. Yeah. He opened up some eyes, clearly, uh, with some important people. Uh, and he's getting the first opportunity to be, be the backup. Ultimately, I mean, Landon Dickerson, we know, is going to play. Where is he going to play? Right. It could be, it could be center, it could be right guard, it could be left guard. If it, if it is going to be guard, then you need a center, and that's where Luke Jariga could could force his way into the mix. But we're talking, you know, 2022 before that would even be a potential. That's right. Um, all right, let's move over to the defensive side of the ball. There's a, a linebacker that kind of, uh, and he spoke to us after practice today, um, who's looking pretty good. Uh, it, it looks more comfortable, more confident. John, who are we talking about? Davion Taylor. Yep. And I've been talking about Davion Taylor for a while. One, he's a third-round pick, but if you look at his skill set, uh, he's just fast. And he mentioned today, you know, they do the GPS tracking, and, and you might see it with next-gen stats when Tyreek Hill gets loose, and they'll say, Tyreek Hill got up to 22 miles per hour. Well, Tyreek Hill is the most explosive receiver in football. Uh, by GPS uh, speed, Davion Taylor's gotten up to 20, 21 miles per hour. That's and that's said, a yeah. linebacker. Right. That's a linebacker. So I've said this pretty consistently, Ed. You look at what Jonathan Gannon has done in previous stops. He's always had fast, athletic linebackers. The fastest and most athletic linebacker the Eagles have by a wide margin is Davion Taylor. And he's getting first-team reps. Yeah. Now, he's getting first-team reps because Alex Singleton's on the COVID list. Yeah. But, you know, Alex is not entrenched. Alex had to fight his way to win a job and played so well they couldn't take him off the field. I don't look at him as a guy who's locked into a starting position. I do look at Eric Wilson as a guy locked in. So... That other position, that other linebacker that's going to be on the field the majority of the time, that's up for grabs. And it might be. It might be Davion Taylor. It, it could be. He was running with the ones. Wilson was running with the twos. But it's so hard to tell who's one, who's two, because Jonathan Gannon talked to us today, and he said that, you know, he likes guys to be very versatile playing multiple positions, even mentioning the up-front uh, defensive lineman. We saw a package today where Brandon Graham was a tackle, and we've seen that before. Um, and and uh, Milton Williams was on the outside at defensive end. Graham was next to him. Hargrave was there, and I believe it was Fletcher Cox lined up as a D-end as well. So I think you're going to see a lot of interchangeable positions up front. Uh, they love Milton Williams. I'll tell you that right yeah. now. They love Milton Williams. This kid, you know, if he does what he's supposed to, he's going to be playing a lot of snaps this fall, I think. Yeah, if you go back to the draft, you remember the draft room uh, dust-up. I don't even want to call it a dust-up. Kerfuffle between Howie <laughs> Roseman and, and Tom Donahoe, who's a senior personnel advisor. And everybody thought that was about Milton Williams, and to a certain degree it was, but it was more about – another defensive tackle that was drafted uh, right before Milton came off the board. And I forget his name. If you if you remember, just throw it in. But um, uh, yeah, It was the kid from NC State. Yeah. Um, and that's the kid uh, Tom liked. But nonetheless, if you, if you didn't focus on that so-called dust-up, you would have looked to the left and you would have saw Jonathan Gannon so excited because yeah. he got Milton Williams. Yeah. And you know, that's the guy who is going to be using him. So I think that is more important, yeah. and he loves him. Yeah. And he thinks he's going to be able to move up and down the line, as he mentioned, play defensive end, defensive tackle. 
and we'll see how it works out but they've compared him to brandon graham has a similar body type uh, it's tough to project anybody who's going to be at that type of level uh, that Brandon has gotten to, but the Jonathan Gannon likes him. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a little bit, looking a little bit ahead here uh, as we wrap this up. Um, tomorrow they'll be back at it, uh, 10 o'clock practice, and then Saturday uh, the practice doesn't start until 5.30 that evening and runs till about 7.30. So uh, pads still have not come on yet, and I'm not sure we know exactly when they will come on. Um, it might be tomorrow, it might be Saturday, it could be Monday, they're off Sunday, but it's going to be great once the pads come on. Elaine Johnson even said that left tackle battle, that right now we're scoring one-to-one, -one, one day Dillard, one day Mulata, that's going to be the telltale sign, is how those guys do in pads. And we'll have it for you when it happens. So uh, thanks for listening right now. I'm Ed Kratz, and that's John McMullen.